Um, we move now to the United States, and the next talk is by Jeff Andruck, uh, that will talk about uh, trichomonas fetus infection in beef, cows, and bulls. All right, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to be here today and visit with you about uh, my favorite subject in veterinary medicine, uh, bovine trichomoniasis. Um, I'm sure most of you uh, realize that this uh, disease is a highly contagious venereal disease of cattle caused by a single-celled protozoan, Tritrichomonas fetus. Um, it's highly contagious based on literature reports of somewhere between 85 and 95 percent of females exposed to infected bulls becoming infected themselves after a breeding season. So um, there appears to be a, a pretty great deal of transmission occurring during the breeding season. Fortunately, I guess for cows, uh, even though infection results in the loss of the pregnancy and an increased number of non-pregnant cows at the end of, of the breeding season, which creates some pretty significant economic impacts for herd owners, uh, cows typically clear the infection and return to normal fertility. Bulls, on the other hand, don't. Usually a bull that's infected remains infected for their life. And at least in the United States, we have no approved and effective treatments for this disease in bulls or cows and not a really reliable vaccine to prevent infection. So control, at least in the United States, is, has relied on detecting positive bulls and removing them from the breeding population. So the objective of this study, objectives of this study were, were twofold. First of all, to examine the transmission between cows and bulls um, to see, actually kind of confirm the ease with which it's transmitted, and then also to examine the ability to detect early infections. Um, the idea being if we can detect them very early in the course of the infection, we can identify those infected animals and remove them from the breeding population. And I have to admit that uh, these two objectives were actually um, minor objectives to a larger project. So if some of the things uh, don't quite make sense, you can ask me later, uh, but this wasn't the primary part of this research project. I'll tell you about that in, in two years from now, I think, I hope. So materials and method. We started with a bull that we identified. We were able to find a, a, an infected bull in, in extreme southwest Wyoming in the United States. Uh, we purchased that bull, confirmed that he was indeed positive through culture and PCR. We purchased 10 cows, crossbred cows of, of varying ages from a local auction market. Uh, we tested those cows six times at weekly intervals to determine or to assure that they were free from trichomoniasis, and these 10 cows were indeed free, and I'll explain the, the testing protocol in just a minute. Once we confirmed they were negative, we synchronized them and then exposed them to the, the infected bull for 48 hours. Uh, once they, the first cow started uh, to exhibit estrus, we turned the bull in and left him in for 48 hours. Starting 24 hours after the bull was introduced into the cows, we began sampling the cows. And the technique was to, to palpate per rectum, to isolate and, and um, stabilize the cervix. The perineum was cleaned. A standard uterine infusion pipette was uh, introduced into the vulva, into the vagina, to the level of the external os of the cervix. And then the cervix uh, was scraped with the tip of the pipette while we aspirated with a syringe to collect some of the mucus as well as some cellular debris. And you can see we did that once daily for the first week and then twice the next week and then just once a week for five more weeks. Approximately 21 days later, one of the cows came back into heat. Actually, they all did except one. Um, this cow was, was in heat, so we used her to attempt to infect some bulls. We had identified her through our testing as, as a cow that was indeed positive. So we had also purchased 10 bulls from a local auction market. These bulls ranged anywhere from 18 months of age to very, very old. Because they came through an auction market, we didn't actually have exact ages on them. We used their incisors to assess age. Uh, the black bull you see there had no incisors, so we assume he's just really old. And there was one other bull that had a couple of teeth. Uh, we did test these bulls prior to, to introducing them to the, um, the infected cow to assure that they were negative. Um, 
tested them three times at weekly intervals and tested with both culture and PCR. Um, and then when this cow that was infected came into heat, we placed her in a small pen and introduced one bull at a time into the pen, allowed the bulls, each bull to mount and breed her one time, and then we removed the bull and put the next bull in. And there you can see we sampled, uh, our technique was the typical technique for the United States, an infusion pipette is inserted into the prepuce, scraped back and forth while aspirating with the syringe to collect the debris from, from the prepuce. And we sampled uh, daily for the first week. And then we were going to sample twice the next week, but it got really hot. It was in July, it was very hot. The bulls and I agreed that it was too hot to be sampling, so we skipped one day. But we sampled on days 14, 19, 22, and 25 post-exposure. All samples, pre and post exposure, were placed into a commercial uh, pouch and incubated at 37 degrees Celsius. Starting 24 hours after inoculation, each pouch was read once a day for four days, uh, placed into the clip provided by the company that makes a pouch and microscopically examined under 100X. Each pouch took about two to three minutes to read to confirm um, whether or not we could see multiple uh, trichomonads. At the end of the fourth day, the pouches were placed in a minus 80 freezer and all pouches were held until the end of the project. At that time, they were delivered to a diagnostic lab and submitted for real-time PCR analysis. So these are the results. You can see uh, we actually have eight cows. Two cows did not exhibit estrus in the 48 hours that the bull was in there. And actually, for the larger project, that worked out quite well. Um, Fortunately, uh, we had some cows cycle, um, and eight of them did. And you can see, by explanation here, the first digit is culture results. A one is a positive, a zero is a negative. The second digit is the PCR result on that same sample. And again, a one is a positive, a zero is a negative. For this project, we considered a positive sample to have both a positive culture and PCR test result. So you can see that uh, the first cow on the list, C1, she was actually, gave us a positive sample one, excuse me, two days after exposure. Um, C4, who turned out to be the only pregnant cow at the end of the project, also was um, positive one day after um, exposure, and then C7 was positive two days after. So obviously we were finding some cows positive Immediately after exposure, you can see C5 was not positive, did not give us a positive sample for almost a month. And um, interestingly enough, when we went to take the bull away from the cows, he was attempting to mount her, but she was not in standing heat or didn't appear to be. But when we got him in a small pen, she couldn't get away from him, and he bred her one time. And that may account for the reason why it took so long for her to deliver a uh, positive sample. It may have been a low initial dose infective dose. The bulls, uh, we only had three bulls give us positive samples out of the eight that decided to participate. The two old bulls sniffed the cow that was in heat and walked over and ate green grass. Uh, they decided not to participate. So out of the eight, we had three that gave us positive results. Again, you can see culture and PCR results and, and how that uh, kind of played out. To kind of summarize, so the range to initial positive tests for the cows is one to 28 days. For bulls, one to six days. The median date in that initial positive test was four for both cows and bulls. When you look at the average positive test, uh, initial positive test, it was almost eight days for the cows and four days for the bulls. When you look at continuous positive, meaning they had a positive test and every subsequent test was positive, um, you can see the range for cows was four to 28 days for bulls, 14 to 19 days. Uh, median to continuous positive for cows was 10 and a half, and bulls, 19. And then the mean, mean to consistent positive was almost 12 for the cows, and um, 17 and a half for the bulls. So the conclusions. Um, obviously, uh, this, this first conclusion is no surprise to anybody in this room. If you know anything about TRIC, uh, it's easily transmitted between males and females. And, when I first saw that, I thought, oh, gee, we only got three bulls infected out of the eight at, 
it kind of, I was a little bit disappointed, quite honestly. I didn't really know what to expect. When you think about it, that's one breeding event. That's not an estrus cycle. It's not a breeding season. That's one mounting and breeding event. So almost 40% of the bulls were infected from a single mounting. Pretty significant transmission. Herd level detection is uh, possible in acutely infected cows. Traditionally in the United States, we've ignored the cows because we say there are they clear the infection, why, why try to sample them? They're not gonna be a reliable source of, of positive samples, even if they are infected. I think the results of the study would indicate that at least in acute infections, uh, less than 60 days, days post-infection, cows are an excellent source of T fetus. In fact, when I was reading the pouches 24 hours after inoculation, you would see literally millions of trick, and the CT values on the, uh, the PCR were in the low to mid-20s. So, a lot of target DNA. And then finally, um, the discussion we frequently have is how late, how long should we wait after exposure before we test a bull? Uh, we typically recommend one to two weeks, but based on the, the, the limited data that uh, was generated by this study, it would suggest that maybe even waiting longer than two weeks is necessary to really be confident. A, a, a positive test a day after is fine, but a negative test probably is not too valuable. You need to make sure that uh, they're negative, maybe up to almost three weeks post-exposure. So I do need to acknowledge some people that helped with this project. Um, certainly Dr. Kathy Whitman was a big help. Megan O'Callaghan, I couldn't have done this project without her. She was an undergraduate student at the time. She's now a veterinary student. And I really have to acknowledge my wife, Dr. Julie Androck, my son Patrick, and, and my daughter Joy. My daughter was 14 years old, and believe me, she did not want to help do this, but she did a really good job. So um, I have to mention her name. So anyway, uh, with that, I'll open it up to any questions you might have. Okay. Is there any questions? Um. It's not exactly about your presentation, but uh, what can you see said about the optimal interval for sampling bulls for culture? Because in my country at this moment, we are discussing about the classic that said the books 10 days, and many people who are saying 20 days between scrappings in the bulls. Between sampling? Um, and I guess I didn't really pay attention to that when I was looking at the data from this project. Typically, we say, you know, weekly intervals. Um, I can tell you in another project that I've done, um, we really didn't see a lot of variation. We did it at weekly intervals, and bulls that had a lot of trick tended to stay high, and the bulls that had low trick tended to stay low. So um, I would say at least a week. I have no, um, no data to back that up. There's yes. another question there. Yes, sorry, just, um, just one, uh, it's a general question. Uh, roughly how prevalent is T fetus? I mean, and not necessarily just on a federal basis, but right across the US, is it very prevalent? I suppose it's just I'm involved in a little bit of testing here in Ireland and we're free of it. So just, we're just wondering how prevalent it is elsewhere. We wonder that too. Um, it really does depend on the region. Um, the first slide I showed you, is pretty wide open spaces. Uh, if you get west of the western half of the United States, trick is a problem. Prevalence is really hard to um, get a handle on. Uh, Texas, I think we're looking at around 2% of bulls tested. 100%. And, and that's the challenge really with prevalence is, uh, you know, Dr. Romano was talking about the Texas program and they only test bulls as they change ownership. And so it's not a random sample to really give you a good idea of prevalence. Um, but I, I know what I hear from other states, it's not uncommon to have about a 2% prevalence. Thank you. 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 Th
prevalence of tested bulls for whatever reason that they're testing. I think there's another question there. Just a quick question. Um, I noticed that you had some, with the cows in particular, some positive tests um, followed subsequently by negative tests. Yes. And so uh, I just wondered, any, any statement, any idea on what the um, sensitivity of a test for trichomonas fetus might be? When you look at diagnostic sensitivity and specificity, I think there's some challenges because it varies depending on who's collecting the sample. Um, if you do a really good job, the sensitivity and specificity um, of a quality sample, the lab is fairly high in the upper 90s, but I think um, there are a lot of variables before the sample gets to the lab that can greatly diminish the sensitivity and specificity. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat>